Hello, and welcome to Catholic Current, where we talk about trends impacting our Catholic faith. I'm James Rogers, filling in for your regular host, Maura Moser. Today, we'll be talking about the National Eucharistic Congress with Archbishop Charles Thompson from the host city of Indianapolis and Bishop Andrew Cousins from the Diocese of Crookston and chairman of the National Eucharistic Congress. Your Excellencies, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, James. God bless you. So, Archbishop Thompson, for those who have never been to a Eucharistic Congress, what can they expect during these days next week? Well, up front, I need to let you know this is the first uh, National Eucharistic Congress in the United States in 83 years, so I haven't been to one either. So, <laughs> But with that said, um, I think they, people should expect some great uh, expression and celebration of faith, um, the focus on Jesus Christ, of course, in the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and the Eucharist and what that means for us as Catholics, as the source of our identity and our mission, carrying forth the good news and transforming the world uh, according to the kingdom of God. And so there will be a lot of a uh, lot to celebrate. There will be several liturgies, types of masses, Eucharistic procession, Eucharistic adoration. There's uh, all sorts of vendors here to kind of books and uh, religious goods and uh, to, to review and uh, purchase, I'm sure. There'll be all kinds of speakers, some of the best speakers in our country. Um, there'll be some international people coming in to join us as well. Um, Cardinal Pierre, the Apostolic Nuncio, will be here. I think over 200 bishops, over 1,200 priests, about 650 seminarians, about 1,200 religious or more, um, and then close to 50,000 people, laity people from all over the country, young and old. So just just a, a, a great um, a great a melting pot of, of of the Catholic Church here in the United States, and all four sorts of ways to reflect and pray and celebrate uh, our faith in in the Eucharist, our belief in the Eucharist as as the real presence of Jesus Christ. As you've mentioned, tens of thousands of people are making their way uh, to Indianapolis. I know I'll be packing tomorrow to make the trip. Uh, that, that's a big responsibility for you and the people of Indianapolis, certainly not a relaxing uh, summer for you. Why was it so important uh, for you to host uh, this critical event in the life of the church? Well, we were honored to be chosen. Uh, uh, we didn't go looking for it. So, I mean, I don't want to I don't want to mislead anyone. Uh, but we are the you know, I think lots of dioceses could have done this. Lots of cities could have done this. So I'm not saying in any way that we we don't here look at ourselves as being able to do something better than anyone else. Although we've had a lot of experience here lately in the last few years, even before I, especially before I arrived uh, seven years ago, uh, of, of hosting national events, especially in the church. We've had the USCCB conference here. We've had Canada Law Society America conference. We've had the National Catholic Youth Conference here for several years uh, since 2011. Uh, so we, we, we're, we do well. We do conferences well, but we are the crossroads of America, so to speak. So. And I think of the cross, or I think of the cross, you know. And so, I think it's, I think I think they say about about seventy percent of the U.S. population can travel to, it can drive to Indianapolis within a, within twenty four hours. So we're accessible. Uh, it's a nice downtown. Everything is is very well connected. Um, and Indiana is just it's a great place. It's a long history of faith here. Um, you know, our the the church goes back to eighteen thirty four was the first diocese in, in in Indiana, the diocese of Vincennes which later transferred to the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Uh, and before that, we were part of the Diocese of Bardstown in Kentucky from 1808. So long, long history of Catholicism uh, here in, in Indiana uh, in the cro at the crossroads of the United States. Such a wonderful faith tradition to share with, with the rest of the church as, as we join you next week. Um, Bishop Cousins, you had mentioned um, you're getting ready to travel. There are tens of thousands of people getting ready to do that very same thing uh, across the United States. And I must say, there seems to be uh, a different type of energy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, of course, at the office, uh, have been working on, uh, on the revival in the Congress, and it's a rare moment where it is also being lived in my parish. And so just seeing how this is kind of reaching across the church, um, I have a feeling uh, that you knew that was going to happen, that you knew this was the right moment uh, for the Spirit to have this moment. Uh, what gave you the confidence to put something uh, so ambitious together as the Congress? 
Well, I think it was definitely the Holy Spirit. You know, we began with what really listening sessions with evangelistic leaders across the country and parish personnel and diocesan personnel way back in 2021. And one of the things that came about from those listening sessions was the United States needed a moment of unity as a church. Um, and we really needed a, uh, if we were going to form a movement across the country, a Eucharistic revival, then that movement needed a moment, you know, and we would all come together and celebrate the gift of that. And that really resonated with me. And they, you know, the suggestion really from, from the people who we were listening to from all different levels of the church was really something a little bit more like World Youth Day, you know, something like where we would come together as a as a body in the church and just celebrate the gift of the Eucharist and really celebrate our Catholic faith in our country. And that really resonated with the leaders of the Eucharistic uh, revival. We had this executive team that was meeting in summer 2021. And so we put it together. We knew it was a big thing, but somebody told me, actually, you know, Bishop, if you carry the flag up the hill, I think all the bishops will follow <laughs> And that's what I decided to do in November of 2021. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit, though, because uh, when I saw the ultimate vote, which if I remember correctly, something like 205 to 12 in favor of a National Eucharistic Congress, which, as you mentioned, is a big deal, right? And just to see that level of unity amongst the bishops was really encouraging for me. And I just, I, I've sensed the Holy Spirit at every moment in this. And even more than I expected, exactly what you're saying, like even more than I expected right now, I, I sense the Holy Spirit has been preparing the country for this moment, uh, which I really do hope will be a great moment of renewal and joy for the church in the United States. Absolutely. Um, what can we expect? What are these days together going to be like? Yeah, well, it's a unique event, you know, um, it's really centered around the Eucharist. So it's centered around celebrating the gift of the Eucharist. But this Congress is really focused on mission as well. And so the days are going to be long and full. You know, we'll begin Wednesday evening with a revival session. We're calling every evening everyone in the stadium for these revival sessions. And these will be combinations of inspiration, prayer, uh, time, you know, for adoration, but also um, just time for celebration of the gift of the Eucharist. And so we'll begin Wednesday night really with the kind of culmination of those four pilgrimages, the pilgrims coming together in the stadium and then bringing the Blessed Sacrament in just for some moments of gratitude to our Lord. And then we'll launch into our program, which will be, you know, the nuncios there, the opening night. We'll have uh, another incredible speaker from the Sisters of Life. So, And then the mornings will be what we're calling impact sessions based on kind of age group and uh, language groups, so Spanish impact sessions, an adult one, a youth one, um, and those will be really aimed at impact. You know, helping you know, helping the those particular groups to take a step forward in their faith. And in the afternoons are workshops of every kind. We have it's amazing the diversity and the uh, experience and the excellence of the speakers who've come together for this event. Uh, it's it's really a beautiful thing. And so afternoon workshops, but also the festival, right? The the, the huge area of booths that everyone can visit and the music that's going to be happening and dramas that will be happening and um, just the experience of being together and all of that. And then coming back together again for a, a revival session in the evenings. Each of those really focused on different aspects of the Eucharist and the healing of the Eucharist, the, the, the missionary nature of the Eucharist, the sacrificial dimension of the Eucharist. All those will be repre represented as we kind of delve deeply into this mystery. For me, one of the highlights will be the, the procession through the streets of Indianapolis, where we really hope to have all, you know, what, whatever we end up being, probably more than 50,000 people on Saturday. We expect to have that there as part of this procession and all the bishops and all the priests. And I mean, there's going to be more than a thousand priests. there. There's going to be, you know, a couple hundred bishops there. This is, this is a, a gathering of the whole church. And then also like, you know, the Vietnamese Eucharistic youth and um, Latino Catholic dancers and um, the various orders of the church, the Knights of Columbus, and and then all of Lady and the religious, all of us processing together in a moment really of bringing Jesus to the to our country and, and really praying for our country and praying that that light, which is shining on us in Indianapolis, might spread through us to the people of this country. Such a beautiful way to emerge as a country and a church out of the darkness and, and isolation of the pandemic. So thank you for everything uh, you've been doing. Archbishop, I also, you are also uh, chairman of the Bishop's Committee for Evangelization and Catechesis. And, and my understanding is that this, uh, Eucharist, this gathering, this Congress 
uh, is really the beginning of an ongoing Eucharistic revival in the United States. Could you give us a little sense of uh, what comes next and, and your hopes for the future? Sure. Uh, and obviously, the all, all, all the credit goes to Bishop Cousins and before him, Bishop Barron. They're the ones that really got this going. And Bishop Cousins has been the face of, of this entire uh, revival for the most part, uh, kind of leading all this. And, and, it's, and I think the vision started with Bishop Barron, who was the chair of this committee prior to Bishop Cousins before me. So I'm just... I'm I'm getting I'm receiving the baton so to speak as the next leg uh, in this relay, uh, but this revival the vision is that this revival the Eucharist revival will continue on and that w different ways to grow and develop and how to provide resources for parishes for dioceses to continue to grow and develop uh, ways of celebrating adoration and how to how to trans how to be transformed this is this is and it all has to be connected to the larger understanding of what church means this. You, we, 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 do, we don't do well when we, when we try to exist in silos. So how does the Eucharistic revival in Congress relate to, say, synodality, to Laudato Si, to, to other things that we're doing in the church, um, and to respect life and so Cali social teaching and all the different ways? How are we being transformed as individuals in a society? How are we growing as a church and a, and a community and giving Catholic witness our beliefs in how to transform the world. It's not It's not just this one-on-one -on -one relationship. So this ongoing revival will be, how do we continue to grow and develop and deepen that sense of our Eucharistic identity, to be people of gratitude, people who truly celebrate Jesus and the Eucharist as the source and summit of our ministries and our services, as, the, as that which fuels us to continue on the journey. You know, here in Indianapolis, we have the Indy 500. So I, I often remind, especially at confirmations, I remind people, you know, there's that that there's there's 200 laps around that track, but they have to, if you notice, they have to make they have to make pit stops. If they don't refuel, they can't make it to the finish line. So I always remind them, the Eucharist is what fuels us. It's it's that's what energizes us, nourishes, us, sustains us to get to the to finish line for us, which is salvation, eternal life, and 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 leading others with us in that encounter with Christ. So. Um, you know, I, I think there's this revival to continue on other ways how we might, you know, we're going to have Eucharistic missionaries calling forth those who can continue to give witness and help help to, to kind of facilitate um, communities and missionaries around the around the country to continue to grow in this energy that's been that's been kind of started here. Um, and to we got a walking with one that Bishop Cousins, I'm sure, will be tell, talking more about. How we invite others back. Uh, we are a church. We are welcome. As, as Pope Francis says, we welcome all. Todos, todos, he says in Spanish. Welcoming all people. You know, we're all sinners. We're all in need of God's mercy. We're all in need of healing. We're all in need of transformation. We're all in need of God's grace to fill up what is lacking in us. And so that has to continue on. Uh, and looking to 20, especially looking at, specifically looking at 2033, the year of redemption, I'm sure it'll be a big year. 2,000 years since the, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm sure that'll be something universal as well as national, and, and I'm sure there'll be something big around this Eucharist revival for that as well. And Bishop, I was struck a couple of weeks ago, you had mentioned um, the Eucharistic processions and the pilgrimages. I, I had the chance to have dinner with one of the perpetual pilgrims, and mm -hmm. I, I was just, as jaded as I am, I was just struck by the way in which her faith was being rediscovered through these pilgrimages, um, the way the faith of the people she was meeting along the way um, was being set afire, and the impact that was having uh, on my own faith. So I think there, there are powerful mm -hmm. moments of grace amid all this work. Have you had a favorite moment, um, even as you were wrestling with all the logistics and the planning that, that, that sticks with you as we approach Indianapolis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, many favorite moments, many favorite moments. But at this moment, if I had to look back on one, it was uh, the launching of the pilgrimage in my own diocese, the Diocese of Cookston. It's one of the privileges of being a leader is I got to pick, you know, um, the launching place in the north. And I said, well, we're going to do that in my diocese, right? And we began at the headwaters of the Mississippi. And we had this beautiful outdoor mass at Lake Kataska State Park, the pine trees all behind us. And as I was processing in, a, a, a bald eagle was circling the stage. And we had a beautiful choir singing. 
you know, about the Holy Spirit as Pentecost. And I just had a deep sense that this was a, a Pentecost. Pentecost was a revival, you know, and that uh, by our own, all the people who were there by our own prayers and our own opportunity to show love for the Lord, revival was happening, not just in our hearts, but in, in places around the country. And it, and it was beautiful to think that at that same moment, we were doing that in the northern part of the United States, you know, uh, right at the source of the Mississippi, it was also happening in San Francisco, and it was happening in Connecticut, and it was happening in Brownsville, Texas. And we were all doing this together in prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And as we did that procession, it was about a mile from the place of the mass to the headwaters, the actual place where the Mississippi starts. You know, many people were in tears, just so moved by the sweetness of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Lord to us. And the Lord's desire to love us and to love our country. So for me, I'd say right now that stands out as a favorite moment. But I, I totally agree with you, which is the grassroots impact of this, right? Those little stories of people who heard stories, is we're not going to know that for a generation uh, to come. Yeah, planting planting quite the seed. This may be uh, an unfair question, but it, but, but it was one on my list. Um, everyone is preparing to come together together. There'll be tens of thousands in person, thousands more across the country able to participate um, from wherever they happen to be. Um, and you mentioned uh, the future. Uh, my understanding is this is the beginning. It's a, it's a year of mission. It's a part of a greater Eucharistic revival that's happening. Uh, what's next? What are your hopes um, a year from now, five years from now, in terms of what this has meant to the church? Yeah, I think that we have seen the birth of a movement in the church, and this happens in various generations, right? Movements that are needed for to strengthen the life of the church. And to my surprise and everyone's surprise, I think we've seen the birth of a movement, and it's beautiful that this is rooted in our tradition. We have a tradition of Eucharistic Congresses that goes back, you know, more than 100 years. It goes back to the 1800s. And that tradition was so strong in our country for the first part of the 20th century. And it's still strong around the world. You know, uh, Italy does a national Eucharistic Congress every five years. Mexico does them regularly, you know. Um, but so I do think the bishops have said to me, they don't want this to be a one and done. And they would like to see us continue this tradition. And so, you know, I could imagine, and I, we'll be talking about this more at the Congress, we'll be making an announcement about the future, but... You could imagine that, you know, in the next decade, there's going to be a, an 11th National Eucharistic Congress. And that in between this corporation, which is run by bishops and founded by the bishops, um, could actually uh, serve Eucharistic renewal in dioceses and in parishes, you know, both by animating the life of Eucharistic missionaries. We have literally hundreds of thousands of people who've really entered into this movement and we have their emails in there and we know they want to be a part of something. And so they could continue to be Eucharistic missionaries and you could imagine diocesan and regional congresses. You know, we had 3,500 people at uh, Bemidji State University for the opening of the North part of the Eucharistic pilgrimage. And that was just from Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. And you could imagine us doing that, you know, throughout the next span of years around the country as we keep this movement going really as a sign of love, intercession, prayer, but also helping the church to continually deepen the uh, Eucharistic love, which is at the heart of the church. And just that desire that every Catholic would experience the love of the living Jesus in the Eucharist. So what exactly that looks like, we got to do a lot. Of, we got to do some thinking after the Congress. I told the team, we, let's do one Congress, do it well, and then we'll, we'll think about the future. <laughs> Absolutely. Archbishop, Bishop, thank you again. For more information on the National Eucharistic Congress and the ongoing National Eucharistic Revival in the United States, please visit www.eucharisticrevival.org. And thank you to everyone for watching. May God bless you as we journey together in the presence of Christ.